I've also been kind of running around like a lost person because I had a recorder and I was going to play it on a song today and I have no idea where I put it down. <laughs> so, huh, okay. So I guess that won't happen. <laughs> it's just on one verse, nothing. Um, As we prepare our hearts to worship today, um, thinking about one of the parables we'll hear later on, I thought we should start with Jesus' priceless treasure, number 595. I hope you all picked up a hymnal and a songbook for use today. Priceless treasures 
and surprising outcomes. And I want you to think about these for a few minutes. Uh, let's start with priceless treasures. What are the priceless treasures in your life? What would you give anything for? Think about that. Probably the first thing came to your mind is the thing that's most precious. And maybe it wasn't a thing, maybe it was a who. Let's go to the, the second one. How about surprising outcomes? Have you had any big surprises in the last couple weeks? Hopefully if you have, they've been good ones and not bad ones. I think we view our church as a priceless treasure. But I don't think the state of the church today is, is a surprising outcome. The changes in our church life have happened gradually and reflect the changes our society and community have taken. But in thinking about priceless treasures and surprising outcomes, we need to be careful not to confuse quantity with quality. Our church life may have changed, but our fellowship and ministry can be just as strong as ever. Thinking of our church as a priceless treasure, we are all called to give everything we have for our own faith, for each other, in this fellowship, and for this church. We must concentrate on what we can do and what we can control, and not so much on things that we can't. And we have to count on God to be a God of priceless treasures and surprise outcomes. Let's pray. Lord, everything is possible with you. We admit that now we see only through a glass darkly. Now we only know in part. Your truths are always before us. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor your ways our ways. We look forward to the surprises you have for our lives, for our church, for our community. And we help hope that you will help us to be part of cherishing priceless treasures and bringing about surprise outcomes. Amen. Now would you stand and sing as we praise our God.
see now, as you look in your songbooks, and remember they're in alphabetical order for the song You Alone, which is a new one we're going to teach you today. Um, a couple months back, Michael, Pastor Michael sent me an email saying, this would be a good song to teach sometime. And, and I agreed, and the time has come. So now, as you look at it, it looks like there's two verses. There really isn't. It's just a repeat. So we sing that first line, you are the only one I need. I bow all of me at your feet. I worship you alone. And then we go back and sing, you have given me more than I could ever have wanted. And I want to give you my heart and my soul. Um, and then it goes on to the chorus. So, if you've heard it before and know it, join in right away. If not, you can listen and then and then join in when when you think you've got it.
reading this morning from the Old Testament, uh, Genesis chapter 29, 15 to 30. Uh, it's a story about Jacob and surprising outcomes. Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your young daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his great love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. And when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. And Laban, Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, It is not our custom to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then, we'll, then we will give you the younger one also, in return for another seven years of work. So Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. The ushers come forward for the offering. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that our offerings this morning would have the same surprise outcome as the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Bless our gifts this morning and multiply their impact to meet the needs of many more people than we could imagine. In Jesus' holy name.
He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. And then in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. These are words from God for God's people. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. God, we thank you for the gift of the scripture. And we thank you for these moments to gather together this morning around the scriptures. And we pray that in these moments, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we pray that the outcome of these moments would not be just that we possess more information about what the scriptures say, but that we experience transformation, that your spirit would work in us so that more and more in who we are and in how we live the life of Jesus is evident. And so we pray in his name. Amen. So, I was in Indiana this week with my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law and their two daughters. We were on vacation there. And uh, my brother-in-law, David, asked me, well, where do your sermons come from? And I was kind of thinking about that. Uh, so in case you've ever wondered where sermons come from, uh, I mean, obviously, sermons come from Scripture. Uh, but before they come from a specific Scripture, uh, sermons come from this. Now, I don't use a paper copy of this. Uh, but this is called the Revised Common Lectionary. I have it on my phone. I have it on my computer. Um, it's something that a number of Christian denominations have gathered together and said, we want to create a set of readings that happen in a three-year cycle. So there's year A, year B, and year C. And through those three years, you wind up reading through most of the Bible. Every uh, Sunday, there are four readings, actually. There's one from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, uh, there's one from the book of Psalms, there is one from one of the Gospels, and then there's one from the rest of the New Testament. And so for every Sunday and every year, there are four readings. And supposedly, uh, those readings connect one with another in some interesting ways. Uh, this morning we're kind of testing that because there doesn't seem to be very much in common between the reading from Genesis and the readings uh, from the Gospels. Uh, but uh, that, so why would I use the lectionary? So the lectionary is good for us as a congregation. It's good for you as people who listen to sermons because what the lectionary does is it saves you from being the victim of what my favorite passages of Scripture are. Because otherwise, I could just kind of preach those in rotation. But what the lectionary does is it pushes me to preach on passages that I wouldn't necessarily choose to preach from. Because they're difficult. And also, one of the things that it does is it keeps us 
looking at different places in the scripture so that over time we look at the entirety of scripture. Now, I have kind of some idiosyncrasies about how I use uh, the lectionary, and they're because of what my job description is. Now, I don't mean my written job description, uh, which I also try to live into, uh, but kind of the general job description that all pastors have. And the most important thing that I do as a pastor is I help you know who Jesus is and pay attention to him. That's the most important thing that I ever do. And so you have noticed over the years that I've been with you that I have a tendency to preach from the Gospels. And that's simply for that reason that I want us as a congregation to know Jesus better and better so that our lives are more and more conformed to his likeness. So the other important job that I have as your pastor is it's my job to help you learn how to read the Bible, to help us learn how to read the Bible together. And so that's why the passages that we're looking at together this morning are good for that. But that's why I read the lectionary. So that's where, uh, that's where sermons come from. So what happens is every couple of months, I look at the lectionary and I figure out which of those four readings we're going to use. And as you figured out, probably about three quarters of the year, it winds up being the gospel reading, but then at times like the summer, it winds up being the Old Testament Hebrew Bible reading, and I give those readings, and, and I look at them, and I kind of get the beginnings of an idea of a sermon, and I give that to Lynn, and she makes musical magic with it. She is able to extract from sometimes not even a full sentence hymns that go along with it. So I'm always very thankful and impressed by that, and I give them to Joan, and Joan comes up with accompaniments and all kinds of preludes and postludes, and it's a great collaboration. But this morning, uh, we're looking at the Hebrew Bible passage about uh, Jacob and Laban and their interaction, and um, we're trying to figure out what that has to do with our life as followers of Jesus. Now, one of the ways that you can know that the Bible is a reliable source for life and for how we understand God to be, how we understand Jesus to be, is that the Bible documents an incredible amount of bad behavior. There is all kinds of sketchy stuff going on in the text of Scripture. If people were just making this up, I think the people would act better, <laughs> significantly. If this were just fabricated, people would be behaving in a lot better ways. And so here in this passage, we have Jacob, and Jacob has already tricked his brother Esau out of his birthright. We talked about that a while ago. And he's talked to Jacob... Uh, he's talked to Esau out of his blessing by getting his father to bless him instead of Esau. Esau's out in the field hunting for game, and Jacob is in there, and he's got sheepskin on his arms, and he's wearing Esau's clothes, so he smells like Esau, and he gets Esau's blessing. But then it's time for Jacob to leave because Esau finds out about that. And so he goes to live with his mother's brother Laban and he begins to work for him and he meets Rachel and he falls desperately in love with her and he says I'm willing to work for her for seven years now here is an important thing that we need to learn to do whenever we look at a passage of scripture there are two possibilities before us one possibility is that the scripture is a prescription for how we ought to live. We look at the passage of Scripture and it is telling us what we ought to do, what we ought to be, how we ought to live in the world, how we ought to live in relationship with other people. That's one possibility that the Scripture contains prescription for us. But there is also in the Scripture an awful lot of what is just description. It is telling the story of how people at different times have behaved 
And that is not a model for us to follow. That's not something that we're supposed to base our conduct on. As a matter of fact, all too often, it is an example for us not to follow. It's, for, uh, it's behavior for us to avoid. And that's the passage that we have in Genesis today. This is not prescription. This is just description. This is just describing how the people are behaving. And so Jacob is there, and he's working for Laban, and he's uh, excited because he's working for Rachel. Now, there's a lot of awful stuff in this passage. There's a lot of really heartbreaking stuff going on in this passage. But the worst thing in this passage is that Jacob and Laban, without even discussing it, just taking it as a matter of course, are treating people as property. It doesn't cross anybody's mind that Rachel would have a thought in her head about whether she wants to marry Jacob or not. It's just assumed that she is the property of her brother to dispose of, as I'm sorry, of her father to dispose of as he wishes. Most of the trouble in the world can be attributed to times when people have treated other people like property. We have a choice in life. We can either love people and use things, or we can love things and use people. And this is an example of people being used, because what happens after... Leah gets married to Jacob, and that's just one of the most heartbreaking lines in the whole scripture there in the morning. There was Leah. I mean, imagine that, that you are stuck for life with this man who obviously does not prefer you, does not choose you. And if you read on in this passage, you'll read some really heartbreaking prayers that Leah prays, hoping that Jacob is going to become attached to her. She feels like, if I can give him children, he will love me, he will be attached to me. But she knows in her heart that he prefers her sister. But what happens when each of these women is married is that their father gives them a servant, gives them, an, in fact, an enslaved person to be their servant, to take care of them. And then if you keep on reading in the story, even worse things happen down the road because both of those women wind up having children with Jacob as well. And that's how Jacob winds up with two wives and a whole house full of children, to quote Rich Mullins. Uh, and it sure does seem, Rich says, like an awful dirty trick, but it's right there in the Bible. And so what do we do when we find passages like this in the scripture, we recognize them as what they are. We recognize that they're not prescriptive for us. They're just a description of how people behave. They're just a description of what happens, and we recognize from that prescriptive principles, like we should not ever treat people as property. And you say, well, that's easy to do. That's actually illegal in our country. There is human trafficking all around us. There is human trafficking right here in our county. And that would be something that we could find ways to work against. But more than human <coughs> trafficking, whenever you treat somebody as a means to an end in your life, whenever you think about somebody in terms of what they do for you, and that's the way that you think about them, you have begun to take just a little tiny incremental step toward treating that person as property when you think about what they do for you, what their function is in your life, rather than who they are as a person. And so we learn from this passage that people are not property, that they're not intended simply to function in somebody else's life, but they are created in the image of God, and God has plans and dreams for each person. <coughs> so in most lectionary sets of readings, there is some kind of obvious connection 
between the passages, and I just want to raise my hand this morning and say, I have lived with these passages for a while now, and I'm not exactly sure what the connection is between the Genesis passage and the passages in the Gospel of Matthew. But that's okay. So what we're going to do, this is like when you finished one episode of a television program and then it comes on again the next week and there's a whole different story. Some of the characters are the same, but some of the characters are different. So we're just going to look at the Matthew passages now. But um, one of the things that is the same, one of the things that's going on is Jesus tells this parable about the flour and the yeast. And if you remember a story that we looked at a few weeks ago when the three visitors came to visit Abraham and Abraham went into Sarah and he said, Sarah, get together a whole bunch of flowers. flour. It was like pounds and pounds of flour. Well, apparently this is some kind of well-received tradition in the, in the ancient Near East because that seems to be what this woman in the passage is working with. She's got like 60 pounds of flour. That's a lot. That's, that's like what? Let me think about it. 60 pounds. That's 12 bags of flour. So I don't know the last time that you've been to the store and come away with 12 bags of flour, but just imagine that. This woman has that huge quantity of flour, and she takes just a little bit of yeast, and it works through all that flour. It leavens it all into dough that can be used to bake bread. You say, well, why would Jesus tell a story like that? What would be the point of it? And Jesus talks in parables. And one of the things that we've looked at in the Gospel of Matthew is that Jesus is very intentional in his communication. He doesn't just wake up one morning and say, I think I'm going to tell some parables. This feels kind of like a parable kind of day. I'm just going to go out there, and when I'm preaching to the people, I'm going to tell them some parables. Jesus is very deliberate in the method of his communication because he says, look, I want to tell everybody the same thing, but some people are going to get it and some people are not. Everybody's going to hear the same message. Everybody's going to hear the same thing, but some people are going to catch on to what it means. They're going to understand what the kingdom of God is like, and some people aren't. And so Jesus is, is thinking, Jesus is thoughtful in his communication strategy, and so he teaches in parables. And what he does is that way he's able to say these really revolutionary things about life, about the world, about who God is, and he kind of flies under the radar because sometimes it just sounds kind of weird, right? It sounds kind of strange. I mean, here are these parables and not everybody catches them. But sometimes what he does is his closest followers will come up to him after he's been teaching, and they'll say, okay, Jesus, that one just went totally past us. We didn't get it at all. We need you to explain it to us. And so there's some places, including here in this part of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus is explaining different parables to his followers. But he tells that parable about the yeast and when we think about that, that's a surprising outcome. You wouldn't think that just a little bit of yeast could work through 60 pounds of flour like that. And what Jesus is saying, Jesus in this passage is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And that's a literary device. It's called metonymy. And so when you watch the news and you hear them talking about the White House, they're not talking about the building in Washington, D.C., what are they talking about? They're talking about the president. And so it's just another way to refer to the president. And so in the same way, when Jesus says, let me tell you about the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about heaven as a place, as a location. It's a way for him to say, let me tell you about the kingdom of God. Let me tell you about the place where what God wants to happen happens. And we can rely on that and we can learn from Jesus when he's telling these parables about the kingdom. He's saying, look, this is what it's like in the place where God is in control. This is how things work when God gets what God wants. When things are happening the way that God wants them to happen. 
And so then he tells this series of parables. He tells a parable about treasure that's hidden in a field. He tells a parable about pearls. They're so precious that somebody would sell everything they had to be able to buy that pearl. And what Jesus is saying is, being part of the kingdom of God is that big a deal. There is nothing more important than, in life than living in the kingdom of God. And so whatever you need to do, whatever you need to give up, whatever you need to get rid of, whatever you need to turn loose of, you need to do that so that you can live in the place where God is king. You can live in the place where what God wants to do happens. And so he's saying that to these people who are listening to him. He's saying, look, the kingdom of God is available to you. The kingdom of God is open to anyone, but you may have to get rid of some stuff that keeps you from living in the kingdom of God. What are the things that hinder you from living fully into the kingdom of God? What are the things that maybe Jesus would be prompting you to turn loose of, to stop holding on to, so that you can live more fully in the place where God is king? And then Jesus tells this final parable in this passage. He tells a parable of judgment. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like fishermen that went out into the lake. And Jesus closest followers, a lot of them had been fishermen, and this was the kind of fishing they did. They would just go out into the lake, and they would drop a net into the lake, and in the net would be collected a whole variety of different kinds of fish. And they would pull the net up, and they would take the net onto the shore, and then they would do what Jesus describes in this passage. There would be a sorting of the fish. Because not all the fish are worth keeping. Not all the fish are worth selling. And so they would separate the good fish from the bad fish. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says the good fish get put into baskets. They get sold. They're valued. But he says there's a whole bunch of fish that are, put, that are just tossed away. And this is a hard parable for us to listen to. This is a hard parable for us to hear because we don't like to think about God as judge. We love to think about Jesus as someone who, as he does, always loves us, always cares for us, always accepts us, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what's happening with us. But what Jesus is saying is there's a point for some people where they are not recovered, not because they can't be, but just because they're not, just because that's not the trajectory of their lives. And so Jesus just leaves us with that story. And then he says, and this was kind of Lynn's theme in picking hymns today, he says, have you understood all these things? And of course, Everybody wants to be the person who understands, right? Nobody wants to be the person who's sticking up their hands. I didn't quite get that. Could you repeat that again, please? I was taking notes on what you said right before. But no, they all say, yes, we understand. And Jesus says, great, every teacher of the law. See, there are these people who their whole deal is that they have studied the Hebrew Bible in detail for years and years and years. And so they have become qualified to teach it. And at this point in Jesus' ministry, some of those people are beginning to be attracted to Jesus and they're becoming followers of His. They're hanging up their old life of being teachers of the law and they're taking on a new life as followers of Jesus. And Jesus says they're like people who have a house and they bring stuff out of their storeroom and their stuff that's old and their stuff that's new. And so we recognize that our understanding of the kingdom of God, it, it was new in Jesus' day. Jesus was saying things about God that nobody had ever said before, but that was all grounded on, that was all based on the Hebrew Bible. It was based on the text that Jesus had grown up with, that all the people that he was preaching to had grown up with. 
like the passage about Jacob and his two wives. And so even passages like that that are just description for us have a value because out of them comes the truth of Jesus. Amen. singing a very old treasure, we learned a new treasure, and here's a newer one as well. We stand as we sing, you are my all in all. So this is Neil Hilton, a friend, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. A friend of Ernie and both of his parents are in poor health. So we want to pray for them. Louise, uh, Joan, you brought back some happy childhood memories with the Mary Farmer, right, Linda? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember my mother instructing her, her piano students to learn that particular song. So you must have learned it from her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and another comment. Today is Sue Howe's birthday. I won't ask Amy oh, if she's a lady, but happy birthday, Sue. Thank you. Yeah, happy Yeah, and you see in the bulletin um, that Pauline Stelmont passed away yesterday. Uh, she was in hospice care. Uh, I don't have any information yet about uh, funeral arrangements for Pauline, but that will be given to you as those arrangements are made. Um, and uh, we want to pray for Bob Marth. Uh, Bob's cancer isn't in remission anymore, uh, so we want to pray for him and for Midge. Um, I want to keep praying for Emma, Richards, anybody else? Yeah. Linda Rice says a sincere thank you to everyone for cards, for meals, especially prayers. Um, they are so appreciated and I'm doing very well and I'm just blessed that I, I knew everyone was praying for me and the power of prayer is awesome. So thank you everyone. So we are grateful for Linda's good outcome, and it's good to pray for each other, to care for each other in that way. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your abiding presence in our lives. And God, we pray for Pauline's family as they feel her absence, as they mourn for her. We pray that they would be comforted by your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you so much for the good outcomes for Bo. We thank you that he is home. God, we pray for Bob Marth. We ask that your hand would be stretched out to touch his body. We pray for Margaret as well, that she would know your presence with her as she cares for Bob. God, we pray for Emma as well. And God, we pray for Neil Hilton's mother and father, as they're both in poor health. We pray that your hand would be stretched out to bring healing in their lives. And God, we thank you so much for the good outcome of Linda's surgery. We thank you for how well she's doing. And God, we live in a world where there is so much hurt and so much pain and so much violence. We acknowledge that we live in a world where people are treated like property every day. And so we pray that you would help us to be creative forces for good to bring about unexpected outcomes of joy and blessing and peace in our world. And so we ask these things of you, you who live with your son, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And would you stand as we close with this verse from Psalm 119, reminding us that the way we know who Jesus is is by studying the scriptures. Would you stand and we're just going to sing the chorus of thy word is a lamp.
So go from this place to live not in your own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.